So um, I'm going to try and talk about cycle-accurate Verilog simulation in a way that's still accessible if you've never come across Verilog before. So I just wonder um, who's come across Verilog before? Okay, some people, most people. Um, so um, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's a hardware description language that's used for digital logic design. Um, uh, if you were to look at Verilog code, it would look something like this, a bit like C syntax, but a bit more wordy and a bit less curly braces. You can use it for designing all kinds of different digital logic, but I normally encounter it in the context of uh, CPU designs. Um, you can take your Verilog code and synthesize from it um, a silicon implementation or target an FPGA, or you can simulate the Verilog code, and that simulation is the subject of, of what I'm talking about. So I usually encounter um, this kind of simulation technique in my work as a compiler engineer at Embicosm. Um, so Embicosm's customers are normally semiconductor manufacturers who are developing their own processor architectures and designs, and we provide them with an open source software tool chain. So that includes things like the compiler, the assembler, the linker, the debugger, and other binary utilities. But we're normally working with them on these tools at the same time as they're developing their hardware. So it's very useful to be able to use simulation techniques for us to test the compiler and run the generated code on uh, a model of their actual hardware. And it also helps tease out some hardware bugs as well early on in the process. Um, so uh, the way I'm going to approach this is just to go over a quick outline of Verilog. If you've not come across Verilog before, it will be a quick primer or maybe a refresher if you're a bit familiar, have a bit of familiarity with it. Then I'll talk about different simulation approaches, in particular for CPUs. And we'll see where cycle accurate modeling fits in with that. Um, then I'll talk about what Verilator is and how you would use it. Um, and then talk uh, a bit more about how you can use trace files and trace dumps to look inside what's going on in the model. There's also a, a workshop tomorrow um, on this subject, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. So. Uh, <coughs> Um, so this is a quick overview of, of Verilog. Um, so you can use it to represent things like combinatorial logic, so things like gates, and, or, and not, and combine them together to compute arbitrary Boolean functions. Um, you can use it to represent sequential logic as well. Um, so things like this is a, a flip-flop. A flip-flop can store one bit of state at a time. It has a clock input, and its state can be updated once on each clock edge. Um, so um, those are the, the sort of basic building blocks, but we wouldn't normally work at the level of individual gates or individual flip-flops at a time because it's too fiddly and fine-grained a level of abstraction. So in Verilog, things are grouped together. Um, so you make registers by grouping together flip-flops. So one flip-flop, uh, sorry, a, a group of eight flip-flops might be represented by an 8-bit register. Um, you can also connect registers and other things together using networks of wires. So the very long, um declaration of these things looks a bit like this. Um, here we've got a, uh, a declaration of a 32-bit register and beneath it uh, an 8-bit network of wires. The structure in Verilog around these things um, is made of, uh, sort of think of as, as three things. So we use modules to um, create reusable, um, to abstract, um, abstract away functionality into reusable components. And then inside the modules, we have the sequential and the combinatorial logic um, to implement, um, to, 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 produce, to provide their implementation. So we'll look at each of these three things in a, a, li a little bit. Um, so first of all, a quick look at modules. So this is the simplest Verilog module that I can imagine. It is um, something which just has one output, and it continuously assigns the value one to that output. So this, the, this, idea of <coughs> excuse me, this idea of continuous um, execution is an important point. In, unlike other programming languages that you might have seen, like C, the Verilog code isn't executed as a sequence of steps that happen one after the other. But in some sense, um, all of the code is concurrently executed all of the time. So it's a, bit, it's a bit hard to grasp that idea in the abstract sense in which I'm describing it now. So if you try and keep it in mind, um, over the next few slides and code examples. Um, this is an example of something that might be a slightly more, more interesting module. So this module 
rep might represent some chip and have uh, some, it might have a clock input, several connections to an SRAM memory, and um, some PMOD outputs for uh, input and output, general purpose input and output. So you can, what this shows is just the interface of that module. There's no um, definition of the implementation here. So if you wanted to make use of this module, you wouldn't need to know what's happening internally. You would just need to know what its interface is. You could think of, it, of this a bit like the function prototype in C, or being analogous to that. Um, um, so next we'll have a look at some combinatorial uh, Verilog constructs. So there's a lot of code on the next few slides, but I don't want to try to focus too much on all the syntax on the slides, but more to give you a feel of the kind of things that you can express easily in Verilog. Um, so um, there's logical bitwise primitives, um, so things like negation, uh, and, or, and not, and exclusive, or, and that kind of thing. You can also shift values up and down in registers. Um, so <coughs> there, um, there's both arithmetic and logical shifts. Unlike in C, you can choose the type of shift um, by using the syntax uh, rather than it depending on the type of the operands. Um, it's often going to be the case that you'll have wires or registers of different bit widths that you'd like to assign to something else that's another different bit width. So what it can be quite useful to do is to concatenate uh, some wires or register values together to create a, a wider bit width out uh, value. So you can do that with this curly braces syntax. Um, uh, I'll just go through a couple of examples on the slide. So in the first, so from the fourth line down, um, we can take uh, two one-bit values, A and B, and concatenate them to assign them to a two-bit value uh, on the left-hand side. You can also concatenate things with constant values. So we concatenate A uh, with the constant one. Or you can con concatenate any number of, um, of values and constants to create a wider output. Um, there's a few more examples on the slide, but I won't go into detail about all of them. Um, but the slides will be available after, and there'll be some more detail in the workshop about some of these things. Um, you can also use uh, if and else constructs to, conditional, to conditionally control the execution of some statements. So the top code example is an example is the is a function that computes the minimum of um, of two values. Um, in general, when you write an if state uh, a conditional, um, that will depend on some boolean value. Um, and then you'll have some statements in the if branch and the else branch. If you want to have more than one statement in, in a branch, a bit, uh, a bit like C, um, you need to put these begin and end keywords around them. So the begin and end keywords are in place of where you would have, say, curly braces in C. Um, something that's semantically a bit different from what you'll have seen um, in software programming languages um, are uh, always blocks. So an always block is, contains some statements that are uh, executed depending on what, what the timing controls say. So the timing control is, is specified after the always keyword with an at. So for the combinatorial logic that we've just looked at, um, the, you would always write at star, and that means execute this block whenever one of its inputs changes. Um, oh. So a quick look at a little bit of sequential Verilog as well. Um, so this is the clocks logic. Um, so you can have an always um, block for sequential logic as well. In this case, instead of the timing control, um, depending on all of the inputs to the block, this um, example is of a block that will be executed or triggered on the positive edge of a clock you could, uh, or its input. You could also use the negative edge. Um, in this example, the, the register A is going to be assigned the, the, the value of B on the next clock edge. So when we write this, there's the syntax for, um, for, for, this, for this assignment in sequential logic is also a bit different to what we've used in combinatorial logic. So we'll have a little bit more of a look at that. Um, 
So these are, these are called delayed or non-blocking assignments. When we write less than or equals, it causes the value on the right-hand side to be transferred to the variable on the left-hand side on the next clock edge. Whereas when we were writing the plain equals assignment um, with sequential logic, the value will be assigned immediately. Um, so it means that you can do some interesting things with registers. So in this code example, um, the values of B and A are, will be swapped on every clock cycle because the, on the, the values on the right hand uh, the values of B and A on the right-hand side are both taken from the current clock cycle, and then they're both assigned to A and B on the next clock, clock edge. Um, so that was a bit of a whirlwind tour of, Ver of Verilog. Um, so just to try and take stock of um, the things that we've just had a quick look at, it's a, a language for hardware description with a, 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 a syntax like C, um, but semantically it's quite different to C with its concurrent sort of execution. Things like always blocks and delayed assignments. Um, you use modules to um, uh, to, to, ab to create um, blocks of functionality that are reusable. And then inside the modules, their implementation uses combinatorial and sequential logic. Um, so I'm just going to talk now a little bit about the different approaches to simulating Verilog. Uh, Okay, so um, the dif there's different approaches to uh, simulating CPUs in particular. So um, one thing you could do is to write an instruction set simulator, which would just be a piece of software that you would code up that implements your instruction set architecture. Um, the disadvantage of doing that is that it's not actually got any relationship to any Verilog code. It's just a simulator for the architecture. Um, so um, what you might do instead is use a tool to generate a cycle-accurate model of the Verilog code. Um, that model that you get out of it will be able to show you what's happening on each clock edge of the model. So um, it's a bit more of a powerful tool than an instruction set simulator for seeing what's going on with the Verilog. Um, or you could use an event-driven simulator, which is um, going to produce a more accurate simulation or realistic simulation in some sense, because it can also show how events occur within one clock cycle as well. Um, so it's the most accurate approach to, um, to simulation. Um, the reason you wouldn't necessarily always want to use that is that it's the slowest form of simulation as well. Um, the instruction set simulator is the fastest form, but um, it's got the disadvantage that it doesn't um, give you a sort of si uh, a, a, mo a timing model of um, or, or connection with your Verilog code. So in between those two approaches is cycle accurate modeling, which is kind of a trade-off between accuracy and speed compared to the other two approaches. Um, so that's what Verilator does. Um, so Verilator is um, a tool that you can use to take your Verilog and it compiles it into a cycle accurate model written in C++ or System C. Um, so um, I'm just going to talk about C++ because I don't know anything about System C. Um, it's a free and open source project. Um, the Veripool project um, that it comes from is for free uh, and open source Verilog and System C tools. Um, it's quite widely used in, in industry and academia. So there's a, I had a look on Wikipedia. Um, there's big companies like NXP and ARM using it as well. And then there's smaller companies like Embicos are making use of it too. Um, so this is the kind of flow if you're using Verilator to build a model of some Verilog code. Um, on the left, if you have um, some Verilog code, you would run Verilator on that, and then it will generate all your C++ model files. So um, although you have the model, it's not going to do anything by itself. So you need to write a test bench to drive it. So that test bench will instantiate the model and drive it forwards in time. Then you can compile and link your test bench and the generated model together. And, um, uh, and that will give you an executable simulator that you can run just like any other program. So um, I'm kind of going to work through an example of using Verilator to model one very simple um, Verilog module, which is a counter. So this counter um, is, is a module that takes a clock signal as input, and then it counts on each clock cycle. Every end clock cycles, it's going to increment the value of an external counter. Um, it's got a couple of other signals as well that um, I'm just not going to worry about for the purpose of the example. So the first thing you need to do to model it uh, 
is um, you write a top module in which you can instantiate the module that you, you're interested in. So um, the inputs and outputs of your top module are things that are going to be exposed to the C++ test bench that it will be able to interact with. So what I've done here is created four inputs and outputs that will be able to be seen from C++. Inside the module, the, uh, uh, the counter is instantiated, and then the um, inputs and outputs of the counter are hooked up to the inputs and outputs of the top module. So in this example, this is just a trivial wrapper around the counter. But for something more realistic, you might have several different modules that you'll be instantiating and connecting some of their inputs and outputs together. And you would only expose a subset of all those signals to the test bench. Um, once you've written the top module, um, you, need to uh, you need to verilate uh, the Verilog code. So I normally sort this all out with a make file. Uh, rather than go into the details of exactly what's in a make file, these are just the relevant invocations from it. So you would call Verilator. It needs to know what all your Verilog source files are. Um, you tell it what the top module is and that you want to generate C++ code, and that's enough for it to run. When it does run, it will generate a folder, usually called Obstur, that contains all of its generated output. Um, so that's ready to compile. Um, inside there, um, you get a make file as well for building the model that it's produced. Um, so you need to call make with that make file, uh, and then um, Usually, there's, three, there's a few different targets that you would want to build. Um, so a target, uh, in this case, vtopall.a, um, is the target for the top module. So the name of the, of the target is derived from the name of the top module. And then there's a couple of other object files that you would always build as well, because they contain utility functions that would be used by um, your model. Um, so that's what, so sort of done on the Verilog and Verilator side. Um, when you create your test bench, um, C++ source, um, you'll have um, a class for the model, so VTOP, that you need to instantiate. And then some of those um, inputs and outputs that we, that we put in the interface of the module are now accessible as members of those in C++. So here in the example, we're setting reset to 1 and enable to 0. Um, if you want to... Once you've instantiated the model, you probably want to actually drive it forward in time so that it will do something. Um, so I normally wrap this in a function for clock in the model. So as a clock is just a signal that alternates between a high and a low state, the clock model function is going to alternately set, its, set that, the clock pin to 0 and 1. Every time it changes the value of the clock pin, uh, you, <coughs> you need to call the eval um, method of the model. And that propagates all the state um, updates inside the model. Um, so uh, once you've instantiated the model you can repeatedly clock it to drive it forward in time and that's sufficient for interacting with the model like a black box um, probably what you're want, going to want to do as well from the test bench is access the internal state to see what it is or maybe modify it so you can do those with tasks and functions so we'll have a quick look at an example of one each of these but before we do that, um, a bit about the internal implementation of the counter. So the counter has a register inside it called internal count. Every time the clock ticks, um, if that internal count is about to roll over, then we increment the external count. Otherwise, just the internal count's incremented. So this internal count's always going on, but you can't see it. Um, so let's write a function and a task to access that internal count. Um, so we can declare a function to access it uh, using the function keyword. After the function keyword, you're declaring the bit width of, the, um, of what the function returns, uh, then its name, so we call this read internal counter. If you want Verilator to expose this to the C++ test bench, then you need to uh, put Verilator public in a comment as well, so it knows to do that. Whatever you assign back to the, value, to the name of the function is what's returned back into C++. So here we'll just assign internal count back to... Um, read internal counter. So if we rebuild the model uh, ver with Verilator and then recompile it, then from the test bench, we can access that function now. So the model object that you have in C++ has got a sort of object-oriented structure that mirrors the structure of the Verilog. Um, so um, 
starting from the model object, um, we have to go through, through the top module, the counter we've instantiated, and then it's there that we can find that function that we just um, uh, uh, that, we, that we've just added. Um, can I just check how I'm doing for time? Five minutes. Okay. Um, so, you could, if you wanted to write back the state with a task, um, then, uh, well, sorry, if you wanted to write back or modify the state, then you can use a task to do that. So, we're here we declare a task with the task keyword. Um, again, it's got to be told very later public so that it knows to be exposed to the test bench. Um, that's going to take an input that's declared, that's going to be the new value of the counter. And then inside the body of the task, we'll just assign that the internal count that's passed in to the internal counter. If we re rebuild the model again, then from the test bench, we can access the task, call the task in a similar way to calling the function through the top module and the counter, passing it the value that we want to um, assign to the internal counter. Then once we've done that, straight away afterwards, we need to call the eval method of the model again to actually get the model to update that state that we've just changed with the task. There is a little bit of subtlety about using a task in this way that I'm kind of glossing over because it's um, a bit... because uh, um, I'm a little bit short on time, but um, there's a little bit more about it that I was going to put in the workshop for tomorrow of the, of the details of that. Um, so... Um, Using functions and tasks is a handy way to access the internal state, see what's going on. But you might not want to code up a function or a task every time you want to check out some internal bit of state. Um, so instead, what you can do um, is create trace files of the execution of the model that you can then visualize. And that can give you a, a much um, easier way to see what's going on in the model. So in Verilator, to do that, um, you just have to create a new trace object, hook it up to your model, and then um, when your simulation is or model is running, um, once it's completed, close the trace file and it will be written out to disk. Um, so the verilator does need to know when to dump its state into this trace file. So what I would normally do is modify my clock model function so that every time the clock uh, goes high or low, uh, the um, state of the model is, is written to the trace file. Um, the trace file also needs to be told what the simulation time is as well, um, because everything's got a timestamp. So you need to keep track of what the simulation time is. Um, you can find that because you're dumping things on, ev dumping everything at every clock edge, this can make really big trace files. Um, so if you find that you're having um, that as a problem, then you might need to think about selectively enabling dumping just for points in time that you're interested in instead. Um, oh yeah. So I was, um, rather than trying to talk about GTK wave, I think the easiest thing to do is to um, just see it in use. So when you open it up with a file, um, a trace file, in the left-hand pane you have your Verilog modules and the signals in it, and on the right-hand side is the wave viewer. Um, sorry, I know it's very difficult to see, but you can basically navigate the structure of your Verilog, um, and then if you pick a particular module that's instantiated, you can see all the signals on the left. So if you're interested in a signal, then drag it over to the right-hand pane, and it will show you what the waves are um, sequentially in time. Um, just going to zoom out a bit. Ah, so you can see the clock there. Um, we might have a look at the external counter, and we can see that it starts incrementing after a few cycles. Why is it doing that? Maybe if we have a look at the internal counter, we can see that that increments um, a lot faster than the external counter. Um, and um, the, um, the process doesn't seem to start off immediately. There's a few clock cycles before anything happens. So we can have a look at the enable pin and see why that's happening. Um, I think that when you look at the, looking at the waves in this way, I think this is actually exposing a bug in the counter because as soon as it got enabled, the internal counter tripped over to one instead of spending a cycle um, when it should have uh, been at zero. Um, so quite often you, you can sort of look at these traces 
in GCK Wave and see what's going on in quite an intuitive way to sort of spot where things aren't quite working as you expected. Okay, um, so that's sort of the end of the quick Verilace tutorial. Um, we've um, used Verilace to build the software model and then drive it with a C++ test bench. Um, then to access and work with the internal state, we've added functions and tasks. Um, and um, to view the entire s the state of the model and visualize it, we've used GCK Wave to look at the change dumps in the trace file. Um, uh. Okay, um, so that sort of concludes the tutorial. Um, there is a workshop tomorrow where um, there will be some material sort of expanding on this counter example if you're sort of beginning Verilog or Verilator and want to try and work through it and see it in a bit more detail. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there's also some um, open source RISC V cores that you can build a Verilator model of and see what the cores are doing and execute programs on them. Um, that's, um, that's all, so uh, thank you for listening.